Welcome to the Forge by Trust podcast. I'm your host, Robin Dreek, former U.S. Marine, spy recruiter, best-selling author, and trust expert. This episode of Forge by Trust is brought to you by my amazing guest today, Dr. Deborah Gilboa. Dr. G and I are going to talk about the big mistake leaders make when they experience change resistance in their team. Dr. G is an expert in change resistance, how to find the root causes and support your team through it. She helps organizations build the opposite of that resistance, change competence. If you find yourself wanting solutions to the change resistance you're facing, get in touch with Dr. G. She has a project that will help get your organization from change resistance to change competence. You can reach her through her site at askdrg.com or email her at her contact information, which is contact at askdrg.com. Coming up next on the Forge by Trust podcast. And then after I finished residency in family medicine, so I see kids and their parents and their grandparents, I thought, boy, I was really trained to help people recover, but not really to be well. Resilience is the ability to navigate change with intention and purpose. Our brain goes, is this the change that's going to kill us? Is this it? Right. And our brain clicks through three reflexes, loss, distrust, and discomfort. That resilience is actually dealing with the stress to get the change we want or that we can't avoid, like a bad diagnosis, and still get the life we want. Welcome to the show. I'm Robin Dreek, and on the Forged by Trust podcast, we decode the interpersonal communication skills of the world's most acclaimed forgers of trust. We unlock the skills and techniques from spies, spy recruiters, master interrogators, globally recognized behavioral experts, C-suite executives, entrepreneurs, acclaimed authors, and thought leaders. Each episode provides specific actions that you can immediately apply to any aspect of your personal or professional life. Today's episode, From Stressed to Resilient, is with a great friend and world-acclaimed resilience expert, Dr. Deborah Gilboa. Dr. G is a resilience expert and works with families, organizations, and businesses to identify the mindset and strategies to turn stress to an advantage. Renowned for her contagious humor, Dr. G works with groups across multiple generations to rewire their attitudes and beliefs and create resilience through personal accountability and a completely different approach to adversity. She's a leading media personality seen regularly on Today, Good Morning America and The Doctors, and author of the upcoming book From Stressed to Resilient. She's also featured frequently in The Washington Post, The New York Times, Forbes Magazine, and countless other digital and print outlets. Dr. G is board certified attending family physician and is fluent in American Sign Language. She lives in Pittsburgh with her four sons. During today's episode, we talked to Dr. G about the impact of stress, confidence, and problem-solving lessons, three steps to coach people through high tempo of change when leadership is not enough, becoming change competent, eight skills to navigate change, and tools for managing discomfort. Hello. Hey, Dr. G, how are you? I'm wonderful. Well, thank you for taking the time to demonstrate your resiliency by doing this while you have a house full of people. I always have a house full of people. That's how having four kids is. And with that, thanks for joining me. And thanks for such an important topic that I'm so happy that you want to share and it's your passion. How did that all start? Because I know you're a doctor, you're well accomplished. How did you get into resiliency and why did that become such an important why in your life? So first there's the personal reason. When I was in medical school, and this goes back to the late nineties, I heard from my professors, almost every class, they would say something like stress causes this disease process or this pathology. Some of them would go so far as to say, stress is the new smoking. Make sure your patients avoid it at all costs. And then every, and and in medical school, it's so fast that you're just taking notes. You're not really thinking critically about what they're telling you. You're just taking it in. It's like drinking from a fire hose. I can't even imagine. (laughs) We get to the end of almost every lecture and they have announcements. They remind us that we should be leading one special interest group and within the medical school, and we should be involved in three research projects and we should be doing clinical hours on the weekends to volunteer. And we should add, and, and I thought, are they trying to kill us? Like, Is it that they don't want us to replace them when they graduate? We graduate. So they're saying stress is the new smoking and we're going to stress you out to death. Why do you you think they do that? Well, 
they do it because those are all the things you need to do, or at least some of those things you need to do and learn and experience to be great at what you want to be great at. And so here's what I started noticing. I was noticing people I really admired, doctors, yes, but also nurses and patients who dealt with tons of stress and yet were doing okay, seemed happy, liked where their life was, had agency, and they were really active about it. So I noticed this in medical school and residency, but I didn't really have time to do anything about it, right? I just kind of watched it go by. And then after I finished residency in family medicine, so I see kids and their parents and their grandparents, I'd been a doc, an attending physician. So after training for like three, four years, when I started to feel more confident in all of my clinical skills. And then I thought, boy, I was really trained to help people recover, but not really to be well. Right. And where would, and where'd you do your clinicals at? Uh, so I went to medical school at university of Pittsburgh and I did my residency at Abington family medicine okay. and, and we talked about wellness, but I didn't know how to get my patients from better to great. Right. And so I did what I'd been trained to do. I went to the medical literature and what I found is that we call that patient resilience, which is maybe a cop out. But if it isn't a cop out, I thought, what is that? What is patient? It sounds right. It sounds right to me. I had experiences with patients where I saw them. I saw people with terrible, terrible lists of diagnoses doing really well and not just medically well, but like they would say they were doing well. And I saw people with hardly any diagnoses or chips stacked against them who were just kind of constantly struggling or suffering. Right. And even beyond the area of mental illness, it was just, there was something. And I thought, what is this? And I looked into the research and what I found is that most of the research on resilience was done in combat veterans or folks with severe mental illness, which is interesting, but not totally useful to me in my clinical practice. Right. A little bit, but not for everybody. So. I got into the research myself. I really wanted to understand when we measure resilience in adults, first of all, is it a fixed trait? Are you born with it? How do you get it? How do you lose it? And what is it? And right. so that's what I that? have spent the last mm, eight years, at least, really diving into. So define it so that the audience understands, all right, it's a nice word we hear it all the time. So what is resiliency? Resilience is the ability to navigate change, not just hard things, right? Not just struggle or adversity. The ability to navigate change with intention and purpose. When I talk to students about it and I put it a little more colloquially, I say it's the ability to navigate change and come through it the kind of person you want to be. And what's fascinating is going back in, in our own lives, we kind of gravitate towards areas that I, we've experienced ourselves did you always want to be a doctor? I mean, when did you decide this was your why and your path? This is being a doctor is my third career. That's so pretty remarkable. <laughs> and now the work that I do as a resilience expert and change navigation with companies and in nonprofits, that's my fourth career. Although I haven't stopped my third career, I still see patients. Right. I think the idea that like there's one path you and I have talked about this, the idea that yeah. there's one path and you know when you're 17 what that is and you will always be correct about that is silly. I think it's interesting. Is, and that's why I'm, I'm kind of curious about is the one path kind of becomes our our lifelong why and we might yes. not be really conscious about it. That's why I was kind of going with that question. Yes. It's like, when did you discover this, this resiliency and passion for it? Because it's been a, a thread, I think, throughout your life. It absolutely has. It's just a question of how have I served it? And so, right, right. you know, according to my accountant, I've had four different careers. So if you want to look at it in those terms, like what kinds of W-2s or W-9s have I had, you'd say, oh, four different careers. But from your 30,000 foot view, I think you would absolutely say, oh, your why has always been to help people make things that seemed hard easier. Right. So where did the resiliency thread start? Well, that's actually probably a, a, a very personal answer. My mom had a, a blessed memory, had really significant bipolar depression. Ooh. And I'm an only child. Yeah. And I really think that it came from being her caretaker at times and just watching things that I thought weren't supposed to be that hard, be very hard for her. Right. So it starts there and 
what's so what's the next spark along that path? Well, when I was little, I used to tell people I wanted to be a pediatric neurosurgeon, but not because I did, mostly because I liked how they reacted to me when I was six, and I would say that. And then uh, see, and those I, are those are impressionable years, though. That's really pretty remarkable. As, as you know, Erickson's developmental progress. You know, he hit that one level of of development, and you have these great impressions happening from from pe pediatric neurosurgeon. <laughs> Right. I hit, I hit the age of reason. It was like, obviously I'll be a pediatric neurosurgeon. Right. And, and then, and I, I really thought for a while, I thought I would be a doctor. And then I got to my freshman year of high school. I'm 13 years old. They make us dissect something in biology and I got nauseated and I thought, well, that's that can't be a doctor. <laughs> I've had it with this. I'm done right. with this. <laughs> like, obviously I'm too squeamish to be a doctor. I didn't know that when we're in puberty, we have stronger reactions to those kind of stims. Uh, so most people are squeamish during pregnancy, during pregnancy, also during pregnancy for the same <laughs> reason, but most people are squeamish during puberty in ways that they are not squeamish as adults. But I didn't know that. And I had started working in theater at my school and it was really fun and it made me it gave me a whole group of friends and there were cute guys and we got to stay out late and it seemed amazing and i dove headfirst into the world of theater and so what do you think the resiliency part of that was i actually really think that it was we got to do a ton of problem solving right there that at that age you don't you know backstage in the theater is the only place that you let 13 14 15 year olds use power tools and right. climb very high ladders and hang things and paint things and make enormous scenery and create new worlds on stage and take on different roles and different characters and it was just this incredible opportunity to explore and do things with a little bit of adult supervision that felt very adult to all of us it's a stressful time in life. It's how resiliency shows up at, a, at an amazing time in life and then keeps morphing through. So you're done with theater, you're done with high school. And then what was the next career? <laughs> I decided, I discovered actually that you could go to college for theater. And I was like, yes, that please. So I got my bachelor of fine arts and drama and finished in four years and got work in theater and wow. was working and working in theater and television, you move around a lot. And by the way, so I got to pause right there because that unto itself has this level of wow. There are very, very few by percentage people that actually major in theater, drama, film that can actually go right from college into it successfully without busking on a street corner, busing tables. A good friend of mine, her son is in New York at a great theater school. And during the summer, he has literally got his guitar case on a street corner busking to get the reps in. Before How I graduated, I went to Carnegie Mellon University's drama school, but we used to joke with each other all the time. Like our friends were getting their resumes polished up to go to, you know, business school interviews, or they were looking for engineering positions or architecture internships. And we were practicing would you like fries with that? <laughs> <laughs> so how did you get your jobs? I mean, how did you get into the industry right out of college? What do you think that was? Some of it is definitely due to my undergrad. They make a really big point of really helping place us in jobs. But in theater, they can only help you get your first job. You know, most jobs in theater, two months, maybe four months. If you're really lucky, it's six months because it's a long run that gets extended of a show. And until you get to someplace like Broadway or a really high level Chicago area theater contract or something like that, you're gonna spend a lot of time as a nomad and you're always doing a gig, hopefully already have your next gig lined up and you're working on the gig after that in between all the work that you're doing. And so I was really lucky to learn about, and I use this now in my work, going to conferences and right. how you meet people at conferences and have the opportunity. I learned about networking before I learned the word networking. So and cool. so that made a difference. And so did at my first job, doing a good enough job that the director said, hey, I'm also doing a show over here. Do you want to help with that now that you have some time free? And then he took me from there to, and that was in Los Angeles. And then he took me from there to Chicago to work on the first union production of, wait for it, Gilligan's Island, the musical. <laughs> And the theme just popped into my head. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I'm sorry for that earworm, but 
it was the Broadway musical version of the state of the show, the TV show. The people who wrote the TV show, George and Lloyd Schwartz, had always envisioned it as a musical TV show. Wow. But because they hadn't yet had television success, the network said no. So they did it without the music, but they always had it in their heads. So in the early 90s, they created it, did it at Summerstock. It went really, really well. And they brought it to Chicago to test it out for Broadway. So I played Mud Gilligan and I was the assistant stage manager. And I learned and I got my union card, my actor's equity card, and I learned a ton. And then less than a year later, I got hired at Second City, which is an improv theater in Chicago and a really great improv theater in Chicago. And I was able to work there for two years. So here's what is amazing to me on this one. You obviously have and had amazing skills in theater. You had talent because you can't achieve things without it. But you mentioned networking. You mentioned these people brought you back. What did they see in you? that made them want to, because we can have all the talent in the world, but if we're not liked, if we're not trusted, if we're, if we don't have something that we're doing that makes people want to work with us, they're not going to choose us because there's a lot of people that can do what you do. Why you, what did they see? Do you think? I think what they saw in me is my drive and my open mindedness about problem solving. Mm. And some of that I learned from my parents who are both you know, first generation children of immigrants. And some of that I learned as a latchkey kid because you just got to find a way and get it done. And some of it I learned in college that, you know, one of my teachers had a sign on his door that said, low cost, good quality, on time, pick two. And it really got me thinking that pretty much anything can get done but the boundaries and the parameters change depending on where the pressure is or what you need from it. If it has to be the highest quality or if it has to be really fast or it has to be done on the cheap. And I learned a lot about problem solving. And I think that that skill set and my confidence that between the people I know and the experiences I have and the questions I'm willing to ask, I don't think there's a problem that I can't be a part of solving. Did curiosity play a lot into this as you were growing up? Were you always curious and part of your problem solving method or how that played? I mean, I, I'm going to tell you a really nerdy, embarrassing truth. And that is my parents had a full set of Encyclopedia Britannica. I remember those. I think I wasn't the only family that had that, right? But I might have been one of the few kids who just sat down and read them. Wow. <laughs> I used to Just cut because, the pictures out for school projects. That's all I used them for. I used to right. masker them. <laughs> totally get why. And I, I did not read them all beginning to end or anything like that. But like, I just, if the internet had been around, that would have been my thing, but it right. wasn't. So this was the most condensed space with the most information that I had access to. Was there anything in there that you particularly gravitated to? I mean, those are a lot of volumes of books. The gross medical stuff. I definitely like that. Huh. <laughs> See? It was all yeah. starting back then. Yep. All right. So we're, we're back up. We're, we're working in theater. We're working in the industry. What was that transition from there? Because that's kind of an unlikely transition. It is. So here's what happened. Two things, really. One, it was a time in the entertainment industry where there was a lot of cocaine. And it was, it was just a time of a lot of excess. And right. it made me uncomfortable. And right. so... I thought, I, yeah, like I, I could keep my job and I could stay at it for years. The person I replaced had been there for like 27 years, but I thought, I don't know that I want to stay here. And there wasn't actually a better job. I could move laterally, you know, stage manager on Broadway would be really, really cool, but the hours and the lifestyle were pretty rough. And I, and I, I wasn't sure I wanted to move back to New York city. And then I thought, you know, I really loved volunteering as an emergency medical technician. When I graduated from college, I had some free time, not at night when I was doing shows, but during the day. And I started volunteering with an ambulance company pretty close to where I went to university. Why? That's an um, amazing thing to do. Because it seemed cool. I, I just, I had always had that sort of affinity. I don't know if you've had this experience or if your listeners have, but in my life, there've always been a few kinds of places, even as a kid that when I walked in, I felt like I belong here. Right. And I think some people have that in certain houses of worship or in certain sure. settings. But for me, it was always schools, theaters, and hospitals. Every time I would walk in and get to see kind of behind the scenes, I was like, this is one of my places. 
And so when I met somebody who was a volunteer firefighter who did what I did in theater, and he was absolutely and kind of an inspiration to me. I was like, oh, I didn't know that we were allowed to do things outside of theater. He brought me to his fire department to volunteer and I did for a little bit, but it was kind of boring because they only got like 40 calls a year. Right. And I talked to one of the guys who also volunteered at the ambulance service. And he said, well, if you go and you get your EMT, which is not a ton of hours to get, you can come volunteer with us. And, and here it is, right? Drive the ambulance. How cool is that? Did you get, did you get certified to do that? Yeah, so I got my EMT and my emergency vehicle operators course, in which I learned the important lesson that any car can be a convertible one time. And uh, <laughs> like, what happened there? <laughs> when you look well, when you learn to use the jaws of life, it's basically like using a sa sardine can opener on the uh -huh. roof of a car to get someone out. And uh, yeah, our our professor, our teacher for it, like to say any car can be a convertible once. Anyway, <laughs> I thought this is really interesting and it's really fun. And I volunteered doing that for a while. And then I left to be in LA for this and Chicago for that. And I really missed it. So I called a friend who'd been a paramedic and I said to him, I'm thinking about becoming a full-time paramedic, like quitting theater, getting work as a paramedic. What, aspect, he, what aspect of it did you miss, do you think? I loved the urgency of it and the connection of it. You really meet people who are willing to get to allow you to get to know them very well, very quickly. Right. And you just, you meet somebody at a moment where they really need someone and you can be that someone. Service. And so this friend of mine said to me, you would make a terrible paramedic. Huh. And I was so sad and so hurt. And I said, why would you say that? And he said, because you're always trying to change the system. He said, I've run calls with you when paramedics and EMTs run calls, paramedics are in charge. He right. said, I've run calls with you and you're so, you ask so many questions. And this goes to your question of curiosity. Right, said, right, right. You ask so many questions about why do we do this? And wouldn't it be more efficient in this case to do that? And why do we have to follow that Problem protocol? Solving. That there you go again. <laughs> exactly. And he said, just go be a doctor because paramedics, doctors are their boss, right? They report right. to the doc. The doc gives them orders about what to do. He right. said, if those intermediate steps, you'll be miserable and all the people you work with will be miserable too. <laughs> and I thought, I'm sure I'm too old to be a doctor because I was 25. Right. Ancient, <laughs> obviously. Right. Yeah, sure. So I called Northwestern's medical school one day because this is before the internet. Right. And I said, hey, I'm thinking of applying to medical school. What's required? And this woman said, a bachelor's. And I said, in what? Imagining that she would say biology or at least science. And she said, college. And I said, I totally have one of those. <laughs> I had to take four courses, four individual courses, biology, chemistry, physics, and organic chemistry. And I had to take the MCATs. But all I very finished daunting out the season. courses. Yeah. I finished out the season at Second City and I went to my boss and I said, hey, listen, this is going to be my last season here. And he said, oh, you'll be back. They all come back. And I said, well, I'm not going to the theater down the street. I'm going to med school. He said, doesn't matter. A funny PS is that he was correct. About 20 years later, he saw me on a television program in Chicago doing the work I do now and texted me and had me come over to his office. And we ended up doing a show for about a year that oh, wow. combined my work on resilience with Second City's improv and music and games. And we did a show called What's Happy Got to Do With It? And it was awesome. So he was right and I was pleased. But when I left to go to medical school, I had to take those classes. And one of the theaters that I had worked at was a deaf theater company, Deaf West Theater right, Company right. in California. And so I'd gotten really interested in sign language from that experience. And I had learned all the swear words and a couple of other words. And when I decided to go back to undergrad for this one year of transitional classes, I was paying to be full time and I could take sign language. So I did. I took several semesters of sign language very quickly in a row. And then my teacher sent me to test to be an interpreter. So career number two, if you're keeping track, is that right. I was a professional ASL interpreter. And I used that to fund my year of undergrad, my year of interviewing for medical school, and then to pay for groceries for all four years of medical school. It's funny. We started out saying that the why is resiliency. 
but so far the why I'm really seeing is service and connection. And I think that the why in my life is about service, but that sounds kind of, I mean, first of all, it sounds self-aggrandizing, but it also sounds really selfless and it isn't selfless. Right. The why, the service is being of use to other people is really validating. Oh yeah, it's huge. That's why it's so healthy for us to do it. And the problems that I have noticed that I'm best suited to solve are problems of helping people see something that they know a a lot about, right? Themselves, their own situation, and just turning the lens a little bit and helping them choose to look at it from a slightly different angle. Right. That I think has always been what I was trying to do. And, And a lot of these things ended up braiding together. You know, when I finished medical school, I was a sign language interpreter. My residency said, you can recruit deaf patients if you want. So I ended up with a big panel of deaf patients. And now in my practice wow. in Pittsburgh, more than half my patients are deaf or the parent or parents of deaf kids. So I've managed to, I've been lucky enough with my, you know, being trained in performance and in theater and in television and in sign language and in medicine. And now I get to do all of those things in a way that I think serves people best. I'm curious about the being a, a doctor for deaf children. How challenging is that? It's not because it's a language I'm fluent in, right? If you're fluent in Croatian, right? And I said, hey, can you do your job also in Croatian? You'd be like, heck yeah, that's fun. And so is it, it but still no different or? It's really fun. And there are some particular challenges for the deaf community. Just interestingly, you speak English fluently. Was that your first language? Yes. Okay. Who'd you learn it from? Yeah, parents. Right. That's our first language usually. But for deaf kids, 90% of deafness is not genetic. So 90% of deaf kids are born to hearing parents, which means they are not the source of that first language usually. And so this causes cultural differences in the deaf community that for for good and ill, right? It can be a real struggle and a real gift. But so navigating some of those issues is different than I speak a different spoken language as well. And when I see families in that community, we don't have those same cultural issues. But the truth is, every culture has its advantages and its obstacles. Right. And you just did a, a great example. This is the example and the power of context, understanding what the other person sees through their optic and lens, which is empathy, which I think it's a great segue talking about the things that bring us stress let's keep going into that area from being a doctor of the death. <laughs> it's just crazy, amazing skills. So here's what I, when I got into researching this idea of resilience, you know, what is it that helps some people navigate change better than others? I started to learn more about the neuroscience. And the thing that I think is the most useful for people to know, if they take one thing from this conversation, it's that we have a narrative, just like my professors did, of saying stress is bad, avoid it but you can't. Why is that? Because our brains interpret all change as stressful, Mm -hmm. even the stuff we want. So I got to drop off one of my kids for his very first day of college on Monday. I wanted that. I wanted that for him. I want that for me. I'm so grateful for that change. It was dang stressful. Right. Dang stressful. Definitely for me, a little bit for him. It is stress is not just like, oh, it's a natural byproduct of life, like exhaust is a natural byproduct of driving a car. No, our brains drop the same chemicals if we hear of a new COVID variant than if we hear we got our dream job. Right, right. And the reason that our brains do that is because although our brain has a million functions, it has one job to keep us alive. Right. The good news is we're currently alive. The bad news is all change is suspect, not just the bad stuff. So our brains say, okay, we're currently alive. Oh, something is different. And that something could be, I walk in and there's a new vending machine in my work, right? Like they change the brand in the vending machine or my coworker put their chair on a different side of their desk. Our brain goes, is this the change that's going to kill us? Is this it? Right. And our brain clicks through three reflexes. Loss, distrust, and discomfort. It says, what could I lose? You know, like, did they notice a resource that I haven't noticed? And they're, or they're sitting that way. And when the sun comes in, it's blinding them. And now, and I'm not, 
right? So what can I lose? Right. Distrust. Did did my coworker really do that? Or did like the cleaning person just move it that way and they're going to put it back the way it was and everything will be fine. Did I really get that job? My dream job. I got the email. I got to read that email again. Did it really say me? Did I really get it? And then even as we start to accept, okay, this is a change that's happening and I can trust it maybe. Then our brain says, great, what will be uncomfortable about it? Right. You know, now when you want to just really quickly under your desk, look at your phone, your coworker has a sight line to see you do that. That'll be uncomfortable, right? right. So loss, distrust, and discomfort are these three reflex reactions. But what I really want people to take away from this is that stress is not a toxin. It's a tool. Sometimes it's awful. No question. And it can be damaging, especially if it's layered on top of other stresses or if we never healed from a previous stress that we've been dealing with. But we also can't get the change we want without it. Resilience is navigating change, coming through it, the person you want to be or with intention and purpose. But the life you want, if you are already living exactly the life you want, wonderful. Please go back outside and enjoy it. But if there's something that you think you want to work on or could be better, or is going to be different whether you like it or not, like my kid going away to college. Mm -hmm. It is necessary for us to figure out how to navigate change, which includes handling the stress that our brains give us because of it, and being less winded by it. That resilience is actually dealing with the stress to get the change we want or that we can't avoid, like a bad diagnosis, and still get the life we want. I love that term. So how do we not get winded by it then? Very much like exercise. If I told you that walking up one flight of stairs to have this conversation with you, I got a little short of breath, but I'm healthy, I assure you, then you think to yourself, she should probably walk up more stairs, right? One flight of stairs, if you get winded. Right, more, more reps. Great, I'm gonna need some exercise. It's unfortunate, but it's true. So in the same way, if six months from now, I wanna grow my business or move in with my partner, or have another child in my home, or join a committee, or pick up a new hobby, or get certified as a private pilot, anything I wanna do six months from now that's gonna represent stress and change, I need little amounts at least of stress and change on the way there to get stronger and be ready for it. Because right. stress is to resilience as exercise is to body fitness. Right. One of the questions that popped in my head while you're sharing this, at what point does stress become trauma where it becomes negative? So stress can be negative without being trauma also. Okay. Trauma is an experience that either breaks your some a core belief. And now we're talking about psychological trauma, not physical trauma, right? Right, right. I meant psychological. Okay. I just yeah. got, and just reason why I, asked, I, I just got done reading The Body Keeps a Score, which talks all yeah. about the trauma. And I thought it was Absolutely. a fantastic book. And so I was curious about how For that sure. factors in. So, And so you'll tell me how this compares to what you read. In my understanding and the work that I've done, psychologic trauma means either a change in your a core belief that you have or a, a degradation of your personal sense of safety. Yeah, there you go. Safety, safety, safety. Yep. So I'll give you an example of the pandemic. I I did a lot of hard work during the pandemic, like many people in the healthcare field. I was in the ICU with patients and I was having, you know, I was showing up at people's homes for house calls in a full hazmat suit. I was talking to people and begging them to get the vaccine and not be on a ventilator. Like there was a lot that was really difficult. It was really hard, but it was not for me a trauma because it didn't change any of my core beliefs right. and it didn't change my own personal beliefs about my safety because I'd been a doctor through the H1N1 ep epidemic. Right. And so I didn't have the change in belief where I thought I was safe and couldn't get something awful that would kill me or bring it home to my family. I already knew that. So it was horrible and stressful and difficult but for me, it was not a trauma. I was also lucky enough not to lose any of the people in my nuclear family to COVID, right. which is another way that can undermine your core belief or your personal sense of safety. And creates fear, right? And so for the vast majority of people who hadn't professionally had to think about epidemics and pandemics and really take it in, it did amount to a trauma. Sure. And 
for one in five families in North America, they lost someone who is in their nuclear family, which is always a trauma. So that I think is, is how I look at, so stress is a part of trauma, but not all stress is trauma. So then, because you brought up such a good analogy that everyone in the world, and, and this is easy not to timestamp because everyone for generations can remember the impact that COVID had on us and mm -hmm. the trauma it caused. How do you coach people through the stress of the tempo of change that we had in the last bunch of years? Because change is inevitable, happens all the time. And it's the it, rate that's really picking up speed. Yes, yes. the tempo has been tremendous yes. domestically, yes. abroad, everywhere, which impacts our resiliency. So what do we do mm -hmm. about it? How do you coach people through that? I want people to look at, first of all, I really, I'm going to say three things. I'm going to give you three steps. The first step is have empathy for you, for yourself. How do you do that? That's a great, that's a great thing to have. By acknowledging that, yeah, all change is hard. Stop being like, oh, if I was just stronger, oh, if I was just mm. less lazy, or oh, if I was just smarter, or oh, why do I always do this? It's a reflex. Please don't be angry. It's like it's like being angry at yourself for having your heart rate, rate speed up when you hear a noise that scares you. Right. It's just a reflex. You have zero control over it. It's a great analogy. So have empathy for yourself that like, right. That's a reflex. You don't get mad when I tap you on the knee with my reflex hammer and you kick. You're just like, oh, that's a thing my body does. Okay. If you can look at the lost distrust and discomfort reflex reactions to change and just say, just watch it go by. Be like, oh, that's a thing my body, my brain does. Okay. Now, that's a hard thing. I don't like how that feels. That's the empathy part. Part. The second part is to figure out which category your stress goes into. Is it unavoidable? You wouldn't want it, you wouldn't pick it, but it's unavoidable. Like finding out my mom had cancer. It's awful, but I'm not gonna say to her, okay, well, I'll check in in two years, let me know how it went, right? I have to engage with it. It is right. unavoidable, awful, but unavoidable stress. Okay, the second category, and there's some overlap here, is it useful? Is it moving me towards a change that's that I want or I need? Right. Right? And then there's a small third category, which is stress that is avoidable and useless. Run away from that stuff. Right. right. <laughs> Set a boundary. If it is avoidable and useless, somebody tries to pick an argument with you about the produce that they were touching and you were just looking at, and you don't have to have rutabaga tonight, you can be like, enjoy Time to move and walk away. Rutabaga, right. Right, run from the rutabaga. So. If it's avoidable and useless, you set a boundary. Now let's go back to the vast majority of stress, which is either unavoidable or useful or both. And the third thing I want you to do is reverse engineer it. I want you to figure out, okay, either what do I want from this? Not what do I wish it was, but like, who do I wanna be at the end of this? And then reverse engineer that, make the choices that lead you to that. So when my mom got a terminal diagnosis, I couldn't change that for all that I'm a doctor, doesn't matter, right? So I really thought, well, what do I wanna know at the end of this? You know, if we're able to have a miracle or she passes away, whatever it is, what do I wanna know? And I wanted to know that I was, as to the best of my ability, I was the best daughter I could be in that right. situation. To be a mom to my four kids who were at the time six up to 13. So, and, those two groups of people were 500 miles disparate from one another. So it's not that it was simple, like, oh, I'll just do everything for my mom. I couldn't. I had to leave her on a day of a major surgery because I had to be there for my kiddo's sixth birthday. And then right. I had to go back and miss his party, right? Like you're always in those situations, robbing no Peter choice. to pay Paul and right. given less than you would like to every situation. But I thought, okay, I'm going to make sure I'm as aligned as I can be with my priorities in my actions. Yeah. It, it it sounds like you're doing was you created during a, a calm time, what your personal brand is, you know, who you are and what you represent. So when stress hits, you are honoring behaviors that honor that brand about who you are and what you want to represent at all times. And so even if you have that Kobayashi Maru from bad geeky restaurant from Star Trek, where, you know, there's no right yes. answer, but you're still yep. honoring who you are to be the best mom, best daughter you can be. 
it gives me a compass. It doesn't right. mean that it's not a storm or right. that the compass never flies out of my hand. Another great analogy. <laughs> it just gives me a compass to look at, to be like, when, when you don't know what to do, because I talked about loss and distrust and discomfort, and that all comes from the amygdala in the center of our brain. Right. It turns up to 10. The way we turn it back down to a five, we cannot turn it off. It is a safety mechanism. Just like I can't turn off the safety mechanism in my car that locks the seatbelt when I hit the brakes even though it's way more annoying than helpful so far in my life. Right. Um, you can't turn off your amygdala, but you can turn it down by asking yourself one question. What choices do I have? Right. So the rest of this cycle, because this is the awful part, change happens or we hear about a possible change, loss, distrust, discomfort. At the bottom of the cycle, and I can give you this graphic if it's helpful for everybody to put in the show notes. Sure. At the bottom of the cycle is choice. And not even listing the choices, just remembering that you have choices in how you act or what you choose or your attitude or your words or whatever, or in your prayer, whatever. Remembering that you have choices automatically turns on your prefrontal ventromedial cortex right here at the front of your brain, which turns your amygdala from a 10 out of 10 down to like a six or a five. It dampens the fear response that leads to all that loss, distrust and discomfort so that we can start to think. Then you list some choices. Well, I could do this, or I could do this, or I could do this. And you engage with one or more of those choices. And that allows reunification, not necessarily reunification with your dream job or with your family or with my mom's oncologist, reunification with the kind of person I'm trying to be. Right. This is something I have total control over. Right. I think that kind of brings me to probably my, my last question. Something that really struck me that you had that I saw, and that is when leadership's not enough. What's that? So here's what happens. I talked about that reflex. When we tap a knee with a reflex hammer, uh -huh. we kick, right? So if you bring your kiddo to me for a well child check, I sit him up on my table. I listen with my stethoscope. We talk, we joke around. At some point I pull out my reflex hammer and I tap their knee and they kick. If I stand right in front of them while I tap their knee, what's going to happen to me? Whammy. They're going to kick me. <laughs> Do you chastise your child for being disrespectful and kicking the doctor? No. You probably do not. You probably, at least in your inside voice, think, boy, is she a moron? Why did she stand right in front of my kid when she tapped their knee? She knew what would happen, right? Right. But here's the thing that leaders often miss. Lost distrust and discomfort are reflexes, and they can no more control them then that kiddo can control their foot flying up when I tap their knee. And yet leaders announce change. And in the absence of change, leaders can go on vacation. If everything is staying exactly status quo, we don't really need our leaders as long as we have systems. Right. But because there's always change, we always need leaders. Right. A leader announces a change or suggests a change and people kick loss, distrust, right. discomfort. And leaders think, don't you trust me? They feel hurt or betrayed or angry or confused because they think if I've done my job as a leader, people know that I have our company's mission in mind, that I have their best interests in mind, that they can come to me if there's a problem. So of course they should just want this change that I am suggesting after all the work I've done to make sure that it's the right change for us. That if I'm a good enough leader, people will be excellent and welcoming when they have to navigate change. And that is not the case. The brain doesn't work like that. The brain's just trying to keep each person alive. And so it doesn't matter how amazing a leader you are or the incredible relationships you have with your people or the trust exercises you've done or the team building knots you've untied with each other's hands. Our brain will still say, what could I lose? Right. Can I trust this change, not the person who announced it, this change and what's going to be uncomfortable about it? So leaders need strategies. And I've been lucky enough, along with Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon, to do the research and dive into what are the evidence-based, scientifically validated strategies that actually help people move through this process and get out of their amygdala and back into their prefrontal cortex. And there are four strategies that I go into in my work that people can learn pretty easily actually to use, but they have to get it out of their head that if they're just a good enough leader, people will be change ready. 
Right. Our brains will never be change ready, but they can learn to be change competent. I love that. Especially, I, I think that is so important for people to, to listen to and hear that, hey, there's always going to be a reflex. There's going to be a reflex kick when change happens. So how do you strategize for that? What's something that people could start doing right now to start on this path of resiliency before they come to you? <laughs> In my book that just came out and the research that we've done, what we found is that of the you know 350 different questions we ask and about hold resilience. Hold on one sec. Name the sure. book. We're going to hit it again in the show notes, but I want to hear that title right now. <laughs> it's called From Stressed to Resilient, The Perfect. Guide to Handle More and Feel It Less. Ah, that's a great title. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> and what we learned is that there are eight skills that help people navigate change more easily. Yep. What are they? We sure. talked about some of them. Build connections. Mm. Set boundaries open to change, open to different possibilities, right. manage discomfort, set goals, find options, take action, and persevere. Great job. And if I could wave a magic wand and give everyone one of those, it would be the ability to manage discomfort better. Ah. I thought for sure when we figured out this cycle, this resilience cycle, mm -hmm. that loss and distrust would be the biggest obstacles for people to get out of that that's where they would get stuck. And that is not at all what we found. What we found is that although loss is profound and distrust is really complicated, it's actually discomfort where people get stuck the most in negative coping mechanisms yeah. and patterns that don't serve them or their mission. And they never get to choice because they get so mired down in trying to manage their discomfort. So what you could go do right now if you want to is one of two things. One is jot down a list of all the different things that you do when you don't like how you feel. The good stuff, the admirable stuff, the embarrassing stuff, the actually dangerous stuff. And then scratch out the things that are dangerous to you or to someone else. Now you have a list of your positive and neutral coping mechanisms mm. so that you can lean on those when you're uncomfortable. That's fantastic. The other thing you could do is try to grow that list by listening. And this is one of my, my favorite tricks for this. Listen to interviews with people you really admire. Mm. Because if you listen for it, they will tell you, even if the host never asks, a few things that they do that help them manage discomfort. And sometimes hosts will ask about self-care or they'll ask, oh, how did you handle that? Or what did you do in that moment? But if you listen for their tools to manage discomfort, you'll find a few more to add to your own list. Absolutely. I love that. Dr. G, where can people go to find out more if they want to keep going on this great path to resiliency and managing the stress in their life? I created a really cool free tool online so that you could put in a change that you're navigating and tell me what you've done so far in terms of these eight skills. And I'll give you a couple of strategies tailored to your own particular situation. So that website is called stressedtoresilient.com stressed to resilient.com. It'll be in the show notes. And I actually went to it again, right before the show started. It is fantastic. What a great new tool that you can have in your life. Dr. G, thanks you for all you do for bringing resiliency and a good positive can do outlook to everyone that you touch. Thank what? you so much for having me. I really appreciate it, Robin. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning into another episode of Forge by Trust. If you enjoyed the show, took away a few new tools, I hope you will click like and leave a great review of the show to show your support. If you're interested in more information about how I can help to forge your own trust building communication and interpersonal strategies for yourself or your organization, please visit my website at www.peopleformula.com. I'm looking forward to sharing my next Forge by Trust episode with you next week when we chat with my very close friend and a top 30 leadership guru, Dove Barron, in the deeply impactful episode, Emotional Source Code.